Thank you, Danny, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Mariella, for having us all here. Without you, none of this would have happened. Uh, I'd also like to thank Guy from Omega 3 Galil. Uh, Guy was our host on Tuesday when I went back to a kibbutz where I worked when I was a student at Cambridge University. So thank you for being one of the sponsors, one of my friends, one of my friends from Thinks, and for being our wonderful host also on Tuesday. So a lot of people have, I've met some wonderful people already, and people say, oh, you're really funny. And I'm so sorry, but this one isn't quite one of my funniest presentations, because I often say, if you know Shakespeare, the dietary guidelines are a tragedy, they're not the comedy. That's for the other things like fiber. So what I'm gonna go through is the dietary fat guidelines should they have been introduced. Now my disclosures, I have no financial ties to any industry whatsoever, food or any other industry. I am fiercely independent. People try to give me money. I say, no, I do not want it. I don't wanna go on any boards. I don't wanna be connected to any organization. I want to write as I find. But my income stream comes from people like you. So if there are any people in the audience who get my newsletter, who support my website, that's my income model. Thank you, I work for you. I don't work for big business and I really appreciate your support, thank you. Without you, I couldn't be here. So what are we going to cover? Well, we're actually gonna cover my PhD in 30 minutes, which is quite a challenge, but I think it can be done. I want to go through the dietary fat guidelines. When were they introduced? What were they? Why were they introduced? And then the substance of my PhD thesis was to take a modern technique called meta-analysis and to apply it to the data that were available at the time. So we have randomized control trials. Most of you will know what they are. The intervention trials, that's when we can establish causation. We have prospective cohort studies, also called epidemiological studies. They can only establish association. So the most unique bit of my thesis was to go back to the time the dietary guidelines were introduced and to say if the panel had looked at the best available evidence at the time, would they have introduced those dietary guidelines? And then I bring it up to date to say, okay, we're not back in that era. We're in the modern era now. Does the evidence support those dietary fat guidelines? And we will see if it does. And then we put my own research in the context of the other people who have looked at this precise topic. Now, for those of you who've seen me present before, I don't clutter up slides with references. There are a lot of references in this presentation. Just go to my website, forward slash PhD hyphen thesis references, and that's where you will find them. So when did we introduce the dietary guidelines for Americans, which then spread around the world? Well, the first event was 1977. Senator McGovern practiced, presided over some dietary goals for the American people. And they then became embedded in the dietary guidelines for Americans that are reissued every five years. So the first were in 1980. We are currently living under the 2015 guidelines and the 2020 guidelines are being worked on at the moment. And the UK followed suit, and then the rest of the world followed suit. So whether or not your guidelines are exactly the same as the US, they are a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. So the two key papers from the UK, the NACNI paper from 83, and then the COMA report from 84. And this is really important to note. When these guidelines were introduced, we did a U-turn in our dietary advice. And the U-turn was from this quotation that Gary presented this morning. I always credit Gary with finding this quotation. It's one of the best bits from Good Calories, Bad Calories. Farinaceous, which is flowery foods, vegetable foods are fattening. How interesting is that? And saccharine, sugary matters are especially so. That's what we believed for over 100 years until we turned it on its head and said, now base your meals on starchy foods. This quotation from the 1984 Coma Report says we used to think that you needed to limit carbohydrates as a mean for weight control. We now think you need to restrict fat. Why did they think we needed to restrict fat? And then we particularly think you need to restrict saturated fat. 
So those are the two dietary fat guidelines that were the subject of my thesis examination, that we should have no more than 30% of our calories in the form of total fat and no more than 10% of our calories in the form of saturated fat. And this is so important. We do not tell people to have a high carbohydrate diet because we know that it's healthy. We don't even know that it's safe. It is the inevitable consequence of setting the dietary fat guideline. Now, as a matter of nutritional fact, protein tends to be approximately 15, perhaps 20% of any natural diet. That's a nutritional fact. Assume it's 15%. As soon as you've introduced a 30% dietary fat restriction, there are only three things that we eat. The rest of the pie has to be made up with carbohydrate. And in case we missed this, in those 1977 dietary goals, they said make your diet 55 to 60% carbohydrate. In the UK now, they are happy if you eat 70% carbohydrate. The fat intake is catastrophically low. So why did we do this? Well, we did it in the name of heart disease. Now, I like numbers, and I hear that apparently one in three people die from heart disease. So I wonder why at the end of every year I don't have to delete a third of the numbers in my mobile phone. Because they play with numbers. Because the fact is that it's of the people who die, approximately a third will die from heart disease. So when all of this started, and this was a 1950s issue, the death rate in the US was 1,400 people per 100,000. Now, of those, approximately 40% at that time were dying from heart disease. So deaths from heart disease were actually just under 0.6 of a percent, or 40%. It depends how you present the data. Now, Ansel Keys used that 40% number. This is Ansel Keys on the right here. He used that number in the very opening of the famous seven country study to present this as a national emergency. Not 0.6% of Americans are dying, but four in 10 American men are dying from heart disease and we need to do something about this. Now, he was aware of the research. There's some fantastic references on this side. All the best research from the Russian pathologists who were looking at autopsies, looking at human bodies, and then they started trying to feed cholesterol to rabbits because they were noticing that when they opened people up who had died suddenly, probably from a heart attack, they had fatty deposits around areas of damage in their arteries. And they assumed that those fatty deposits were the things that had caused the damage. But of course, you may have heard this analogy elsewhere. You find firefighters at the scene of the fire. They didn't start the fire. The cholesterol didn't start the damage. It went there to repair the damage. But this is where the cholesterol hypothesis started. And it's all in the name of heart disease. So Ansel Keys started off trying to see if cholesterol in food raised cholesterol in the blood. And he concluded it did not. And he never changed his view on that. This is the best quotation of his I found in all the literature from a 1954 symposium on, on atherosclerosis. And he said, from experiments, that's randomized trials, and also from field surveys, epidemiology, the cholesterol content of the diet has no significant effect on either the blood cholesterol level or the development of atherosclerosis in man. Now, this is so important because cholesterol, many of you will know, is only found in foods of animal origin. And Keyes knew this. This is a statement from Keyes at that era. Cholesterol only occurs in foods of animal origin. So to test whether or not dietary cholesterol had an impact on blood cholesterol, he took a lot of human guinea pigs and fed them huge amounts of dietary cholesterol which meant that he fed them a lot of meat and fish and eggs and dairy. And he concluded not only did nothing happen to cholesterol, nothing happened to atherosclerosis. So if cholesterol has no effect, then foods of animal origin have no effect. He's tested them. He's found them not guilty. He should at that point have turned to the one macronutrient that he had not studied, and that was carbohydrate. But he was convinced that fat was the problem, and so the diet heart hypothesis took hold. 
So the RCT evidence at the time, this was when my research world changed, and this is when I became a target in the UK, to be quite honest, from people who were believers of the low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. This was The Guardian, this was The Mail in the UK, The Telegraph, The Express, we made Time magazine, the Sydney Morning Herald, the New Zealand Herald, and it was all because of this paper that was released in February 2015. It was the first paper to come out of my PhD, and it was the 64th most impactful paper in the entire 2015 literature, including every other topic, education, climate change, psychotherapy, any topic. That is just to say, thank you. <laughs> I, I don't share that to say we did a great job. I share that to say this is how interested people are in dietary guidelines. And this is how interested people are in the idea that we may have got them wrong. One of the columnists in the UK wrote this fabulous article saying, do you mean to tell me I have wasted the last 35 years avoiding bacon, eggs and butter, and now you're telling me that they're okay? So she was pretty annoyed. I said, this was the RCT evidence at the time. And would you believe that the Dietary Committee in the US, nor the Dietary Committee in the UK, they referenced none of these RCTs whatsoever. This was the best evidence that we had available. You'll be familiar with some of these trials. So you've got the ROSE trial, the low-fat diet one, the LA Veterans Datum. And in this table, which is a great one to photograph, and we can put the slides on that references page as well, you've got who the study was conducted in, so you'll see we have haven't even got two and a half thousand men. They're almost all sick men. They're secondary prevention studies. There's just a, a few healthy men within the LA veteran study. This is mostly the dietary intervention, although a lot of changes were made. So it was very difficult to say that only one change was made. And this was the kind of period of time over which these people were studied. So you put those all together in the modern technique of meta-analysis, and for those of you familiar with that technique, this is the output. It's called a forest plot, and you can see the summary of all the trials there sits firmly on the line of no effect. So you look at the numbers, there were 370 all-cause deaths in the intervention groups and 369 in the control. No difference whatsoever. In terms of the statistical significance, it's not. It's firmly crossing that line of no effect. There is no result between all of those interventions and all deaths. Then you repeat the experiment for heart deaths because we were supposed to be making these dietary fat modifications in the name of heart disease. Again, absolutely firmly on the line of no effect. And there's the numbers. They're not statistically significant. They include that 1.0 very important line. So the evidence at the time said there's nothing for all deaths and there's nothing for heart disease deaths. And you have to include looking at all deaths because there's no point dying more of one thing to die less of something else. So that's why all-cause mortality is so important. So the overall results, a first interesting point, none of those randomized trials actually tested the dietary fat guidelines. Woodhill looked at the 10% saturated fat, and he actually found more deaths in the intervention group than he did in the control group. This is another really interesting point. The average cholesterol levels fell in both the intervention groups and the control groups. They fell more in the intervention groups, but this made no difference to heart disease whatsoever. If you want to quote a paper to show that you can lower cholesterol statistically significantly and make no difference to heart disease whatsoever or all deaths, this is the paper to use to quote that. Now, I think the rationale for this is that the interventions were largely comprised of vegetable oil. And vegetable oil contains plant sterols. And plant sterols will compete, in effect, that's the easiest way of explaining it, in the gut with human cholesterol and replace it to an extent. So if you're consuming things like vegetable oils, particularly corn oil or soybean oil, which is what these studies did as the intervention, you will lower your human cholesterol, but you're putting in plant cholesterol instead. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of think my body is designed to make the stuff that it needs and not the stuff that perhaps the plants need instead. This is the one that made it the impactful paper. Because remember how many people were involved in those trials? Not even two and a half thousand people. All men, 
No women had been tested. No more than two and a half thousand people had been tested, and yet we changed our dietary guidelines for almost 300 million people. No healthy people. It was not what we call generalizable. If we had found anything, it would not have been generally applicable to the whole population. And so interesting, not one single study recommended change. So the Rose Cornell trial actually said we found no benefit and we might have found harm. The Woodhill study cautioned about the potential toxicity of their vegetable oil in intervention. And my favorite one of all, the final sentence in the 1965 paper from the Low-Fat Diet Committee says, a low-fat diet has no place in the treatment of myocardial infarction, heart attack. Those were their conclusions. So in essence, the RCT evidence did not support the introduction of those guidelines. Now, I was surprised at how quickly Public Health England said, OK, so maybe the evidence wasn't there at the time, but it is there now. Well, we'll see in a moment if it is there now. Now, I could have left it there. I could have stopped my PhD and said the best evidence available didn't support the guidelines. They shouldn't have been introduced. But for completeness, I looked at the epidemiological evidence, not least because one study had been relied upon by these committees. This was the paper that came out on the epidemiological evidence. These are the main studies that were available to those research committees back in 1977. Some of these you'll be familiar with, Framingham, you must be aware of, the London Bank and Bus Study, for example. Again, you're only looking at men. These are the length of time that they've been studied, up to 20 years. Not all of them even looked at cholesterol, because not all of them were actually bothered that cholesterol had anything to do with anything. This is the important column, because we're looking at fat here, where they looked at total fat, where they looked at saturated fat, and what were the other foundings. Now, not many people know that not one single epidemiological study found anything, even an association between total fat and coronary heart disease. Not even the seven country study, and not many people know that. They think that it did. Keyes went in thinking that total fat had an impact, and he came out concluding that it was saturated fat that was the issue. But in the literature of the seven country study, when Keyes talks about saturated fat, he's talking about cakes and ice cream. Now, yeah, there's sources of saturated fat, but more of sugar. And he was the only one to find anything against saturated fat, and yet that was the one study that was referenced by this committee. Now, Keyes also said there's no association between heart disease and smoking, or lack of activity, or being overweight. So we now know he was wrong on all of that, and yet we still accept that he might have been right on saturated fat. And far more accurate were the other studies saying, no, there is an issue with smoking. There's an issue with your father's death. There's an issue with other things. Interestingly, there's an inverse association with alcohol. So if any of you enjoy alcohol, there's some research to show that actually alcohol might be good for you. Take care, because the obvious confounder there is wealth. Richer people, certainly in that era, were more likely to be able to afford alcohol and also better health care. So let's just take a quick look at this seven country study because it was the one that made the major influence. So those were the seven countries. It studied almost 13,000 men. Those were the verbatim conclusions from Keyes in the final volume 20 of the seven country study. They're not strident conclusions. They're not strong. He didn't come out saying something causes something. Just they tend to be related to each other. Heart disease, cholesterol, and saturated fat tend to be related to each other. But 25 years later, with a fellow researcher called Minotti, he did a Pearson correlation coefficient on the data from the seven country study. And he said there's a Pearson correlation result of 0.72. If we had known the blood cholesterol level of the men at the time they went into this study, we could have predicted who died from heart disease 25 years later. So I used that data to replicate what they had done to make sure I could find the exact methodology. And when I did it, I noticed a far stronger correlation. I had a correlation of 0.96 for coronary heart disease deaths and the latitude of the country in the seven country study. Now it was 0.92 at the cohort level. Now when you do the R squared, 
for Keyes' result, that explains half. So it explains as much as it doesn't explain. When you do the R squared for latitude, it still continues to explain almost everything. Does it make sense? Well, yes, it does. Because if the country or cohort is further away from the equator, the people have had less sunshine on their skin. They have higher levels of cholesterol. They have lower levels of vitamin D. Was the cholesterol just a marker for the fact that they were less healthy people by virtue of where they lived? So you put those into the prospective cohort studies. Again, we have six. Again, we have only men. None examined the dietary guidelines. The death rate overall was almost 5%. The heart disease mortality um, among that was 1.1%. And then this was actually the significant finding from the seven countries study. Because the seven countries study was the only one of those six that included unhealthy people going into the study. It included a number of people who had already had a heart heart attack. And it found that in people who hadn't previously had heart disease, the death rate over the five years of the study was 1%. For people who came into the study with heart disease, the death rate was 21%. So the key finding from the seven countries study is that the greatest risk for dying from heart attack is having heart disease. Now that sounds daft, but it was actually an important finding that was never reported. Remember, none found any relationship with total fat. One found an inter-country relationship with saturated fat, which is the lowest form of evidence. What Keyes wants you to believe is that any difference in the death rate from Japan to America is entirely due to the saturated fat in the diet, not the climate, not the gross domestic product, not the community, not the sense of family, not any other aspect of the diet, not the sunshine, not nothing, just the saturated fat content. It's quite absurd. So the epidemiological evidence also did not support the guidelines. So you bring it up to date and you carry forward the six randomized trials and you add in the four trials that came since that. Some of these you'll also recognize the Women's Health Initiative brought women into being studied for the first time and then dominated the numbers because it brought in 49,000 women and dominated the numbers here. And you've got different dietary fat interventions. And again, you've got the forest plot sat absolutely beautifully on the line of no effect. That's for all cause mortality. And then you take coronary heart, sorry, that's the numbers for all cause mortality. And then you've got the coronary heart disease, deaths sat on the line of no effect. And those are the numbers. So the best evidence that we have today also says that there's no findings against dietary fat in all the different types of interventions, whatever they did. So we're now up to 10 RCTs that also looked at mortality. For the first time, we have a study that might be considered generalizable. So the Minnesota Coronary Survey included men and women, and it included healthy people. So we think we have something we can apply to the whole population, then you remember that it was conducted in mental institutions. And therefore, it's not applicable to the whole population, not least because many of the medications that are taken for mental illness have profound effects on the physiology of the body and could impact any dietary heart investigation. None examined the dietary guidelines. The STAR study came closest. It tried to examine 27% total fat, 8 to 10% saturated fat. It was conducted on 55 people. It has no chance of achieving statistical significance with those kinds of numbers. Again, we had the cholesterol observation. It fell more in the dietary interventions than it did in the controls, but it made no difference to heart disease. So I'm sorry, Public Health England, but the evidence wasn't there then, and the evidence is still not there now. So for completeness, you bring the epidemiological evidence up to date. These studies are less well known to people than some of the things like the corn oil trial. And they do involve men and they involve women, but it's all over the place. So you can see in some cases, you've got a relationship between total fat and coronary heart disease. And in some cases, it's inverse. So the higher the fat, the lower the heart disease. And the same with saturated fat. In some cases, it's positive. In some cases, it's inverse. In some cases, there's no relationship. It varies sometimes when you look at men and women and different age groups. There's only one that even comes close to us looking then at things like the Bradford Hill criteria 
to say, okay, that's association. Is there any way that it could be causation? So this is not supporting those dietary guidelines either. When you put in total fat and coronary heart disease mortality, again, you've got the forest plot, again, you've got the non-significant numbers. When you put in coronary heart disease mortality and saturated fat, again, you've got the blobogram on the line of no effect, again, you've got the non-significant numbers. So throughout my PhD, it was a story of not finding anything, not finding anything, not finding anything. Not what I expected. I don't know what I expected when I went in. I tried to go in with an open mind. And I went in as a vegetarian. So if anything, my mind would have been towards animal foods are probably not so good for us. And I had to say, I'm wrong. And my father was delighted when I went to him and said, I'm wrong, because he'd been telling me I'd been wrong for 20 years. So he was really happy. So this is just a summary slide for the epidemiological results. Again, you've got seven prospective cohort studies. None examine the dietary guidelines. The evidence does not support the continued existence of those dietary guidelines. So don't just trust me. Let's have a look at other people who've done this. My research team was the only one to go back to the dietary guidelines at the time to see if the evidence would have supported their introduction back 35 years ago. But many other researchers have looked at the whole body of evidence. So back 10 years, Skiaf and Miller, Siri Torino, Hooper, which is the Cochrane study, Chowdhury, these are some of the other researchers who've looked at this. And they have looked at every different variant you can think of. So reducing total fat, swapping out saturated fat, swapping in polyunsaturated fat, you name it, they have tried it. This is the most interesting thing. Among 40 different findings from those team of researchers, and I only included four of mine, not eight, 37 of them were non-findings. Why is that not known around the world? Why is it not known? The absolute majority of the evidence looking at any kind of intervention in dietary fat says nothing was found, it is not a problem. That tells you what you don't need to worry about. So let's look at the three findings. One was from the Chowdhury 2014 group, and it found that trans fats were bad for heart disease. No disagreement from anyone in this room. We would agree with that. So then we're down to the two Hooper studies in 2011 and 12, 2015. And Hooper found an association between cardiovascular disease events and taking out saturated fat and swapping in polyunsaturated fat. But it's important to reiterate that nobody has ever found anything against total fat. And Hooper, even the Cochrane study, has found nothing significant for all-cause mortality or cardiovascular disease mortality or coronary heart disease mortality or myocardial infarctions, whether they're fatal or otherwise, or strokes or coronary heart disease events. So the only thing that they found is this CVD event connection. Now, why did Hooper find something that the rest of us didn't? Well, first of all, she included four studies that nobody else included. That only included about 650 people, but they made a difference. They took it just statistically off that line of no effect. They weren't about heart disease. They were about cholesterol, about diabetes, about skin cancer and they therefore didn't have the heart data published and peer-reviewed. She'd gone to the researchers to ask for that data. So when you look closely at the Hooper data and look at her sensitivity tests within their long 150-page document, you realize that those two findings actually failed sensitivity tests. So when they looked at the studies that not only intended to swap out saturated fat and swap in polyunsaturated fat, but the studies that actually managed to do that, they found no significant effect whatsoever. So we now have 40 findings, 39 of which are not significant, and one against trans fats. And that should be where the world agrees at the moment, but unfortunately it doesn't. So what might the consequences have been? And I've put a question mark here, but it's what I think we need to be asking and we should have been asking for the last 40 years. This is a quote from those 1977 goals from the Senator McGovern Committee. Mark Hegstead, one of the writers of those studies, said there will undoubtedly be many people who say we haven't proved our point. One of the senators was quite concerned and said there seems to be a lack of consensus 
among these nutritional scientists and other health professionals. And some people have said that physical harm could actually result from the dietary modifications that we're recommending. And there was a famous clip that you can find on the internet by Robert Olson. And he's saying to the committee, I pleaded with you in my written document, I'm pleading with you now here in person. We don't have the evidence to inflict this on the American population. And Senator McGovern says, oh, you researchers, you have all the time in the world. We politicians, we need to do something. So we're going to do something. And sure enough, they did something. And they argued against any physical harm in the update of the report that came out later in 1977. But here's just a couple of interesting graphs that might put the idea that it wasn't going to cause any harm in context. Because this is what has happened to obesity in the UK since those dietary guidelines were introduced. Now, it could be a coincidence but I think it at least deserves investigation. That's a tenfold increase. The same happened in the US. This is the famous chart where obesity seems to take off like an airplane at pretty much exactly the time that we told people to eat less fat and more carbohydrate. So are you really sure that we did no harm? Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> okay,